Rokanon's World by Ursula K. Le Guin, 1966. This is actually the first printing of the first novel that Ursula K. Le Guin sold. She sold it to Ace Books, actually to Donald A. Wolheim, and it was part of one of the Ace Doubles. Now, I'm sure Le Guin was ecstatic to have her first book printed. I'm not sure what she might have thought when she saw this cover art. I look at it and I wonder, could a 10-year-old draw this? Enough of casting dispersions here. Let's talk about this being her first novel. In the introduction, Donald A. Wolheim says, We once wrote that while only a few women wrote science fiction, they made up in quality what they lacked in numbers. Certainly among the ranks of the most highly esteemed artisans of fantasy fiction will be found the names of Andre Norton, Lee Brackett, C.L. Moore, Margaret St. Clair, and Marion Zimmer Bradley. Rokanon's World introduces the first book by another of that select group, Ursula K. Le Guin. Mrs. Le Guin lives in Portland, Oregon, and has made her first sales to the magazines. That she has talent will be evident on reading, for the SF reader will find in this vivid interplanetary fantasy elements reminiscent not only of the soaring imagery of the above mentioned, but hints of the fantasy of the Tolkien or Merit type. This may seem extravagant praise for a beginner, but we hope that the reader will sense this for himself and wait, hopefully, for her next novel. Interesting that they assume that the reader would be male. There's one more piece of art within this book, right there on the cover page. And we begin the book with a prologue called The Necklace. The prologue was actually first published as a short story in Amazing Stories in 1964. It was titled The Dowry of Angyar. This wonderful story sets up the background for this novel. This novel also introduces us to the Hainish universe, where we have the League of All Worlds, later to be known as the Ecumen. Le Guin tells us that all the novels in this universe can be read in any order. In other words, it's not a numbered series. Each novel is a singleton. Today, if you want to read this novel, you'll either have to go to a used bookstore or purchase an omnibus with two other novels. Worlds of Exile and Illusion came out from Tor Essentials recently. As you can see, it has her first three novels, Rokanon's World, Planet of Exile, which also came out as an ace double, and City of Illusions. Today we'll talk about Rokanon's World. In the prologue, the story of the necklace follows a princess of a castle. Her name is Semli. She is seeking this necklace that is important to her family. In this short story of adventure, she actually leaves the planet on a ship that is programmed to take her to a station where they've been observing this planet. This station is quite a distance away. For her, it doesn't seem like a long time, but her travel to the station is eight years due to time dilation. Then the return is another eight years. So when she returns with this necklace, she finds that her daughter has grown up and her husband has died. There's great poignancy to the years lost while she hasn't aged. Then we start into the novel proper. We meet Gavril Rokanon. He's an ethnologist for the League of All Worlds. His assignment, the planet Fulmulhot II. So it's the second planet around that sun. This is the planet that Semli came from. He takes a team of scientists to the world. Now the interesting thing about the Hainish universe is that all these planets are occupied by humans. These humans, many thousands of years, used generation ships to colonize all these planets. But they fell out of touch with each other. Only recently, the League of Worlds has come into being. And they are rediscovering planets populated by humans. But these humans are different. On this planet, the humans have taken a number of different evolutionary paths. So we have tall humans resembling us. We also have short humans who mine and have worlds underneath the surface. 
they resemble dwarves. We also have child-sized humans, delicate in features, who resemble elves. In this way, on a science fiction world, we really have a lot of creatures that resemble high fantasy. While Rokanon is at the castle introducing himself to the queen, his ship and his people are destroyed. And it's destroyed by technology that doesn't exist on this world, or at least by its residents. There is some other faction on this world, and they've just destroyed any chance of Rokanon communicating to the Human League of Worlds. With time dilation, even if he had a spaceship, it would take him at least eight years to get out there to communicate with them. Or does it? Le Guin invents a technology that can communicate in real time across light years. This is the very first novel to use something called the Ansible. It's Le Guin's invention. You've probably heard of it. It's been used in many other novels. The only hope that Rokanon has of informing the Human League of World is to find an Ansible in the enemy's hands. Thus, we start an epic quest across this world to find them, to use their technology to send a message, and ultimately, to try to destroy them. There are some difficult decisions to make on this quest, and one that is more of a mystical quality as Rokanon meets one of the ancients. As we follow Rokanon, we see him make friends of different species and some enemies. We see battles and difficult moral choices, and we see love. His adventures reframe how he sees this world and the human league of worlds. The name of this novel ultimately becomes another moral point. Why would a world be referred to as Rokanon's world? I want to give you a taste of Le Guin's prose in this novel. In particular, I want to show you how she begins this novel. How can you tell the legend from the fact on these worlds that lie so many years away? Planets without names, called by their people simply the world. Planets without history, where the past is the matter of myth, and a returning explorer finds his own doings of a few years back have become the gestures of a god. Unreason darkens that gap of time bridged by our lightspeed ships, and in the darkness, uncertainty and disproportion grow like weeds. In trying to tell the story of a man, an ordinary league scientist, who went to such a nameless, half-known world not many years ago, one feels like an archaeologist amid millennial ruins, now struggling through choked tangles of leaf, flower branch, and vine to the sudden bright geometry of a wheel or a polished cornerstone, and now entering some commonplace sunlit doorway to find inside it the darkness, the impossible flicker of a flame, the glitter of a jewel, the half-glimpsed movement of a woman's arm. How can you tell fact from legend, truth from truth? Beautiful prose from a beginning writer. Le Guin's writing draws you immediately into this world. Her characters grow through the adventures, and we come to see how myth and legend are formed from the story in this book. Rokanon's world definitely fits into the space opera type storytelling that was popular with Ace Doubles, but it also shows a depth that is unusual in these stories. There's a deep current running in Ursula K. Le Guin's writing that touches our souls and makes us question our moral blind spots. We see that editor Donald A. Wolheim is correct in lavishing praise on this new writer. I find her writing uplifting and challenging. I give Rokanon's World 8 out of 10. Recommended. I'm going to put on the screen a bibliography of Le Guin showing the first 10 years of publications. I've read and covered on this channel Rokanon's World, The Left-Handed Darkness, and A Wizard of Earthsea. I plan to read the other two early novels set in the Hainish universe, the two sequels to A Wizard of Earthsea, and The Dispossessed. I've created a playlist for this decade-long look at Le Guin's work. It's called Author Colin Le Guin, Comma, Ursula K. Stay tuned 
for more Ursula K. Le Guin on this channel. Until next time, keep reading.